Welcome. Happy Wednesday to everybody. Thank you for joining us here this evening for a discussion around city and government in times of crisis. Um, there's certainly a lot going on with uh, the COVID pandemic and other systemic issues panning out around the nation right now. And very excited to have a couple alumni with us along with Dr. Dora to share and lead and engage in this discussion. If you have questions, please throw them in the chat bar and we will be sure to get them answered for you. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Dora, and let you take it away. Thank you, Emily, appreciate it very much. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. I know that we'll have some more people join us along the way. Um, tonight's agenda is some brief introductions. We'll talk to a series of folks who have served in city and county government, what we call local government management at USC Price, and ask them to talk about their responses during a crisis. Maybe they'll be good enough to talk about what they learned in the MPA that's useful and what they're doing today. Uh, but any commentary uh, at all is, is always appreciated. Our, our alumni tend to be experts when they get to us. And so with a little bit of uh, USC shine on them, um, it's always interesting to talk to everyone again. It's one of my favorite things about teaching because I learned so much from uh, just all of the students who are in the class who are doing extraordinary things. And then as Emily said, we'll do Q&A um, at the end so that you have some time to talk and ask them. This is the second in a series. We did one several weeks ago um, on, with our first responders, Jonathan Westendorf, fire chief in Ohio, and Sean Hallman. Um, who's a civilian with the U.S. Navy in San Diego, who turned his hobby in whiskey distillery into doing hand sanitizer. So um, let me move on and just tell you who's with us tonight. Emily, if you want to slide the slide. There we go. Uh, I am the program coordinator for our MPA online. I've been teaching at USC since 1996, which since I was 12. Um, and it's been my great honor to be with the uh, number one ranked uh, MPA online program in the country. We are 10 years strong um, and, and having a, looking forward to building this year. We're having a great year. I'm very pleased tonight to include some of our favorite alumni. Catherine Cooley is here from California. She's the assistant city manager um, for the city of Citrus Heights just outside of Sacramento. Keith Regan is here. Aloha Keith. He is in Oahu on, in Honolulu. Um, formerly the CEO of Maui County, who has decamped uh, to another island and is now in a state agency. Stacey Richardson uh, has gone backwards. She was with the city manager's office in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when she came through the program and has since taken a job in Washington, D.C. with the National League of Cities, um, handling innovation and design with them. Um, but during this pandemic, Stacey is back in Chattanooga, so that's where she's talking to us tonight. And Chris Himes, who was a Navy flyer while he was in the program, most often turning in homework off a destroyer somewhere floating off the Atlantic. I was never quite sure where. Um, today, he's assistant city manager in the city of Manassas Park. Uh, so he's on the East Coast in Virginia. So thank you all for being here tonight. I thought I would start with just a, a little bit of context about the way we think uh, about local government management. USC in our program has two tracks. Uh, you can earn a certificate in addition to the master's degree in our program. The city and county government uh, track really attracts a number of people who are either working in the field or like Chris is coming out of the military uh, and wants to go into government. The kinds of issues we talk about in local government management and maybe our alumni will touch on tonight are things like the jurisdictional issues that's playing out today and the conversations that are going on this week about military and police responses to the latest riots. Uh, legal constraints, which has been some of the issues around the pandemic and who responds and what are the constraints about the testing and the agencies and the uh, work that's being done to develop therapeutics. Financial capacity always is a consideration in local government. As you know, they're funded differently depending on the city and juris county jurisdiction and the state that they operate in, obviously the political will of the electorate, and then the people that they elect to public office to lead us in the political will of our leadership in elective office. Community interests are important in the local government management. And I just had to add, based on our conversation about ethics, the importance of the transparency of the action that we take 
uh, as a leader in city and county government. Um, some of the questions you might think about asking our alumni after they talk is about the approaches that they use, um, possibly to public safety in terms of, are we protecting the vulnerable first? Who are we protecting? Um, manage the management of expectations, which is always difficult, particularly in a crisis. Um, I like to talk about the tyranny of the possible, right? The constraints that are left to be able to get something done um, when what you want to get done isn't actually what's possible to get done in the moment. Um, do the outcomes actually match what people want to have happen or their understanding of what should happen? And then the kind of tools that we can practice what are best practices we borrow from each other? What kind of planning do we do? This obviously is getting called into uh, greater attention in the, in the resulting pandemic. What do we do in the short term? What are we gonna do in the long term? And obviously my pictures there hope to represent kind of the, the three crises that are coming together. The pandemic, that's a map of Virginia. Um, the kind of work that's being done based on the economic crisis by students actually at USC who are running a Trojan food pantry for the community around the university. And the picture from the 1968 riots in Washington, D.C., obviously with uh, Robert Kennedy walking through the rubble. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, each alumni in turn and ask them to make a few remarks. And after the four of them uh, have shared whatever thoughts they bring to us tonight, um, then we'll open up, we'll look at the chat line and, um, and that pose, I'll moderate questions to the, to the four panelists. So Catherine, I'm so pleased to have you here tonight. I saw you in Sacramento last fall. Um, so I guess this is as good as it gets. So we're going to zoom together. So. <laughs> this Thanks is, I, I miss my USC family and being able to be with you in person a lot, but I'm so glad we can connect this way. So thank you for having me. So when I was thinking about this topic, one thing I thought about is that USC really teaches you to consider um, every piece of the pie and know how to approach it. And I've been really grateful for that. So yes, there, there has been how, you know, the issue of how do we address this pandemic and Quite honestly, that's been one of the easier parts. One of the more difficult parts is how do you address the things that come along with that? So for example, for cities, uh, revenue loss is going to be very significant as a result of this pandemic, very significant. Uh, for a city such as Mine, we're probably going to be, uh, we're probably going to lose about $3 million over two fiscal years, which for a city our size, is that's significant. Um, and Stacey Richardson, one of our fellow panelists, is doing work at the national level to advocate for the need. Um, but so far, local governments haven't been included in stimulus packages. Um, and so I've definitely been appreciative of my USC education Within the first week of all of this coming down, uh, I would say I was definitely one of the few people at the table who understood what was going to happen in terms of economics. Um, and, and I was saying the very grim things, but they were, they were true. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that. So we're Effective advocacy has become hugely important to express our needs both at the state and federal level. Um, and it's, it's gonna be important for at least two years, more than that, more intensely over two years. Um, also, we've, it's been interesting to see the impacts regarding public safety that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Again, obviously there's the, there's the, response to the pandemic. And we have been able to handle that. We have been able to get PPE supplies. But then you think about, so we curtailed proactive enforcement, right? And what does that mean? That means your traffic collisions and fatalities increase because we aren't giving tickets, there's nobody on the road, and people are driving way faster than they normally would. And we've had some fatalities and one that even involved a child. Um, and so I, th I think a USC education teaches you to look at the unintended results of, of a 
decision. I mean, no decision is ever going to be perfect, but, but we've noticed those sort of things. Property crimes have increased in commercial areas because um, our criminals know that they are, uh, our commercial businesses are vacant, whereas our residences are full. So we're really not having people break into homes or having people break into businesses. Um, we, we've experienced that. Um, also, and this is a particularly sad one, domestic violence regionally is up because you have people confined in their homes with their abusers and they really have nowhere else to go. Um, and all of that has been um, really, really fascinating to watch and really has taught me to be a, a better administrator to try, to try to anticipate those things that aren't the obvious things. Um, also, we've participated in the Great Plates program through FEMA. Um, and, and as I was rolling out this program, I definitely thought back to some of the articles that we read in our program about Hurricane Katrina and how FEMA works or doesn't work. <laughs> and I haven't experienced those things. Uh, but it's, it's been a great experience in disaster management. Um, and if anyone here wants more information about that, I'd be happy to talk with you. Um, and then lastly, I think public information in these times is key, 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 key. And also to just know who you want to communicate with and how you can best do that. And I think we're going to work on this for the next couple of years to have it down. For example, we thought, oh, we'll just, we'll just move to social media. People, people will get stuff that way. And we realized we really weren't connecting with our senior population. And so we had to do a mailer to let everybody know uh, what was going on within like the span of a week um, to target a residence within our city. And that's how we were able to connect with our seniors. So um, I think don't, don't assume that you know how people interact with your government um, and you'll learn lessons along the way that way too. But, but definitely communication was huge for us, huge. Um, and I'm so thankful for our team on that. Um, and so th those are my basic thoughts on how this has played out. Uh, but it, it's going to be an interesting couple of years. Thanks, Catherine. We'll be back to you with questions. Uh, Keith, I'll call on you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Aloha. My name is Keith Regan. Um, a USC alum, and uh, you know, you know, it's been. Um, I come. I have a little bit of a, a unique background in the sense that I, I've had the experience of working in local government as well as now in the state government. I want to echo everything that Catherine said because she was totally on point with some of the challenges that we face, you know, within local government. And it's not, it's not only unique to local government, but it also, you know, expands into the state government realm as well. And I think one of the, the tremendous values of the USC education, for me at least, has been uh, opening my eyes to the importance and the understanding of strategic planning. You know, you know, we go back and we think about our, some of our other courses like intersectoral leadership, you know, you look at human behavior, you know, you look at policy and program evaluation, all these um, classes and, and you know, that we've had the opportunity to be engaged in and, and to learn from has really helped, ha helped me personally um, over the years being in local government to understand how things are interconnected. I think that is probably one of the most important aspects of um, that I took away from the program was, you know, how do you leverage that, those relationships between whether it's, you know, other county or city departments or whether it's other county and cities, period, or perhaps even at the state or federal level, you know, and making sure that those relationships you know, are, are, are healthy and that you can, um, you can learn from each other and you can support each other through crisis. Um, one of the things that, you know, and having been at the county level, we deal, we've, we dealt with hurricanes, we dealt with, um, you know, earthquakes, tsunamis, flooding, uh, you name it, um, we, we dealt with it, but not, I, we never encountered a, a pandemic situation like what we're dealing with now. And I think, you know, if you were to ask anyone, you know, six months ago, if they thought that this was something that should be on their radar to be concerned about, I can guarantee you that, 98% of local government leaders would say, what are you talking about? This is not, 
you know, this is not our issue right now. And, but I think what we've learned over, you know, the last six months is that we have to be prepared for basically anything that's going to be thrown at us and, and be able to respond quickly and, and to be able to scale up, you know, certain aspects of our operation to be able to, to, to address those issues. And so, you know, one thing we have to realize, we can't, you can't do it alone, right? You can't just do it, you know, in a vacuum and, and expect that you're going to be successful. You have to lean on other partners. And I think that was one of the things that I, I really took away from the USC program was um, not only from what was being, you know, taught to us, but also by working with, um, you know, others within our program and, and working in the team environment and using technology to be able to communicate and leveraging that in our, in our day-to-day um, uh, program, I think has, was really extremely valuable for me. And I think also, um, like Catherine was saying, you know, you need to communicate with people where they want to be communicated and how they want to be communicated too, you know, and recognizing that not everyone's on social media, not everyone is, you know, Zoom literate, and not everyone understands how to do a Facebook Live, but these are technologies that are so prevalent now and so necessary, you know, for us as in local government and state government to get our messages out there. So, you know, I, a lot of, um, there needs to be a lot of um, work done um, within those communities that maybe have challenges um, from a technological standpoint to um, get that message to them um, in a way that they can understand it. So they're not left out of the conversation. They need, you know, they need to be part of that conversation as well. So, you know, leveraging technology, I think, is really important, you know, for us. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention that, you know, um, Catherine mentioned budgeting. And, you know, that has been one of the biggest challenges for us. I work for the Hawaii Tourism Authority. We're a state agency. We are, our mission is tourism. And, you know, with this crisis, we essentially went from, you know, having 10.4 million visitors a year, 30,000 visitors a day, to literally, um, you know, and, oh, and by the way, 240,000 approximate visitors living in our islands at any given point in time to, you know, to now 200 visitors a day, um, you know, and who knows, maybe a thousand, a couple thousand visitors in our islands at any point in time. Um, and, you know, you talk about the impact to a, a state government budget. Um, that's a $17 billion industry that we're talking about for the state of Hawaii that has literally come to, you know, a screeching halt. Um, and in the face of this pandemic, you know, how do you, how do you even prepare for something like that? You know, what, what do you, you know, what are, what's the next step? And I think having gone through this education at USC, it's prepared me to understand the importance of looking at all aspects as it relates to the, to, to the budget and how can you, you know, potentially address some of those shortfalls um, in a way that's not going to completely cripple the ability of, for government to act. Um, you know, the, the TAT, the transit accommodation tax brought in over $600 million into the local, into the economy, into state government, I should say. And then 113 or 100, no, 123 million of that went back to local government. So, you know, you have counties that were dependent on those monies that are no longer going to have access to that because there just simply is no money to distribute. So, you know, you talk about being short funds, think about a local government now all of a sudden not having $23 million in revenue coming into their operation. How do you adjust for that, right? And um, that's a huge challenge for a local level. And for us as an agency, you know, we rely on, se- we get $79 million out of that 600 something million dollars that's generated on an annual basis. We're getting zero. So for fiscal year 21, which is, we're preparing for that right now, um, we have no TAT revenue to support our operation. We're, we're living off of essentially savings, you know, from prior fiscal year or this current fiscal year. Um, but yet we have a huge mission. Uh, so anyways, it's a, it's a big challenge for us, but uh, I can, I can honestly say that um, it's thanks to what, what I went through at USC that I'm, I'm ready to take that on with our team and move forward. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here tonight. Oh, Keith, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to come back to you and ask a question about Airbnbs because it's on my mind, but we'll wait. Stacy, you've come out of local government, gone to the federal level, uh, working with legal, legal cities across the country. So uh, tell us a little bit about your work. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Dora, and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. I'm excited to be back with some of my USC colleagues. Um, like Catherine said, I miss being with my Trojan family, so it's nice to be back with everybody. Um, so, you know, whenever I came to USC, I was a chief of staff to a mayor already. Um, so I kind of thought I knew what I was doing, but I, I talk about my leadership with my team now as pre-price and post-price <laughs> um, because I feel like I was instantly able to apply some of the theories that we learned in, in, our, uh, in our classes in, into my job in the real world. And um, it, it made me a much better leader and it helped me understand leadership better. Um, and understand the complexities of local government and how it interacts with different sectors. And I think having that knowledge whenever you go into a crisis is absolutely critical to addressing some of the components that, that my, uh, my peers up here have talked about. Um, and, and crisis will happen, right? Today it's the pandemic, but I've had to respond to a terrorist attack before. We've had mass shootings in Chattanooga. Um, you know, floods, hurricanes, Chattanooga had a tornado in the midst of the pandemic. Um, so local governments are on the front lines of responding to these, um, these disasters and these situations. And my education at Price certainly made me feel much more confident walking into those situations and, and being in those rooms where decisions have to be made quickly and people's lives are going to be impacted. Um, and my work at USC, um, I'm sorry, my work at NLC, I have, um, I've been at, at NLC since the beginning of um, February. And I am officially working on issues at the intersection of government and technology. So um, NLC recently released a resource guide for local leaders about digital contact tracing and how to leverage technology um, to help with the, pan uh, help with the pandemic response. Um, I, I've worked on some of those types of topics at the intersection of how technology can help aid our response at the local level. Um, but NLC, as Catherine alluded to, has launched a, and I'm, I'm working as a strategist on this campaign, uh, the Cities Are Essential campaign, which is seeking to get direct federal assistance um, to the local level. Um, as Catherine alluded to, all of the stimulus bills thus far have not included any direct federal assistance to cities. Um, NLC's research projects that cities may experience up to $360 billion of lost revenue over the next three years. Um, a survey of our members shows that 90% of them are expecting budget shortfalls. Um, we're already starting to see cities consider things like furloughs, layoffs, service cuts. Um, and if we're serious about getting our economies open safely and keeping them open, cities are going to be essential to that fight. Um, and so I, a huge part of NLC's role is this advocacy um, position at the federal level. Um, so, and, and NLC is also, I should say, I think it would, um, my colleagues at NLC would not be pleased with me if I said, if I left this out. NLC is also working really diligently to provide local leaders with resources around racial equity, uh, especially in policing, uh, with what we've seen over the last week in our cities across the United States. Local leaders are trying to keep people safe um, and also trying to make the necessary changes at the local level to be able to, um, to respond to what their constituents are, are seeing um, and feeling and living every day. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to the discussion um, and, and uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Stacy. Appreciate your perspective and, and learning more about the advocacy work that's done at the federal level. Um, Chris. You, you here represent having a military background. I know you're a helicopter pilot, um, if I have that right, my memory serves. Um, and you wanted to be in local government, although you have a finance background. Um, so tell us a little bit now that you're where you want to be um, through those career paths. Tell us about your, uh, your work now with the city. Yeah, absolutely. So um... Yes, I uh, actually went through the program uh, while I was still active duty U.S. Navy. Um, I'm now in the reserves uh, and uh, a testament to time uh, management and limited bandwidth to be able to get some of these projects and assignments done. So if I can do it, literally anybody else in the program can. 
Um, unlike some of my counterparts that kind of currently spoke, you know, kind of coming in with a little bit of familiarity with kind of just kind of government in general, I had absolutely no idea uh, kind of about the kind of the general frameworks that governments uh, could leverage out there. Um, but the one thing I did have was just kind of my own understanding and convictions around some of the ideas that I had kind of bringing to the table. So the one benefit that I found the biggest part about USC was how to correctly channel and how to actually um, provide substantive weight to those convictions to be able to actually apply them to the like the, the frameworks that USC can provide you with. You know, they equip you with the research material, the peer reviews, they equip you with the um, the professors who can guide you and kind of hone your ideas. And essentially the whole thing was your argument sounds great, but if you can't prove it through these kind of predetermined frameworks that we have, it doesn't mean anything, you know, in the long run. So um, kind of using some of those, uh, let's say like, um, I believe it was uh, Catherine from as far as like, you know, we kind of have the ability to understand all of the, all of the facets that goes into a thing. So like you'll learn about like logic models and a lot of these other kind of program evaluation techniques and methods. And, you know, I learned all of this, you know, kind of went through uh, the program. And then after my time in the Navy ended um, in 2017, which was almost two years after um, I finished the MPA program, I actually started to kind of go out and search for what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a local government administrator. You know, I kind of took a little bit of uh, 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 off the beaten path route to the private sector. Um, I actually got um, presented with a unique opportunity to go work for, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase. It's a great institution. Then for me, it was now being exposed to not just the um, the the finance and just kind of the uh, general um, understanding of just understanding data, but now you're doing it at such a grand level. So now you're dealing with not even just big data, but like monumental data. You know, I work on projects and programs for assets that, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars. So how do you even hone that amount of information? And so that kind of taught me kind of a crash course in understanding the merger between technology data and how we can actually channel and hone that to in this case, um, attach it to some of those, those programs that we need to kind of develop as local government and in order to combat certain issues. Um, so how did I get into local government then? Well, I actually kind of tapped into my uh, local ICMA network here in Virginia and I found a couple of people that were looking for some talent coming from the private sector and kind of the uh, uh, a non kind of government background and I found a city here in Manassas Park, Virginia that was way behind the eight ball. You know, they were hit hard by the 2008 recession. They had delayed a lot of their, um, what people would consider to be kind of routine technology initiative improvements across the years. And one thing led to another and 10 years down the road from the recession, they're still way behind, especially in Northern Virginia where it's a variable, you know, keeping up with the Joneses for our counterparts here, because you're surrounded by, you know, Arlington, you know, where HQ2 for Amazon is going to be landing. You have Alexandria, Virginia, I believe it's where uh, uh, Dr. D still resides. You know, you have huge, powerful counties that, you know, pretty much as Northern Virginia goes now, the rest of Virginia goes with, you know, Fairfax and Loudoun and Prince William County. And here you have little Manassas Park embedded in all of that. And we look like we're about 15 years behind everybody else. Um, so I was just getting into the position for about a year. I identified my big strategic plan, my IT strategic plan. I had this whole thing lined up, ready to go. And we were going to hit, you know, improvements for their GIS infrastructure. We were going to refresh our website. We were going to do new, really unique community engagement projects. We're, we're lining up all of this tech, our online engagement strategy. And then boom, COVID hits and pretty much everything comes to an extreme halt because the one thing that we forgot was our own city's current business resiliency. Could we work from home? Could we do anything that we thought we could do when nobody was in city hall anymore? And that was a big challenge for us to kind of adjust on the fly because we didn't have uh, where I was coming from, JP Morgan, where you know they are very, very on the cutting edge you know, where I am now, you have people that have been working for the city for 20, 30 years and have challenges dealing with new technology. And now it's like, okay, do what you do, but do it at home and do it, you know, through mediums like Zoom or GoToMeeting or whatever you're using to kind of conduct um, your kind of routine face-to-face -face team meetings and stuff. So um, that's where 
that's where USC will kind of teach you to understand how to attack new problems. Um, and I thought that was another great thing too. And especially through the capstone program is just kind of understanding how to understand issues, which sounds weird to say, but it's actually true. And then be able to apply what you know with what you are seeing to what you need to actually improve upon and go for it. So um, we were essentially doing everything that we were planning on doing in purpose now at home. I had, a really good experience with my online learning environment. So I figured that anything you can do in person, you can now do online with a degree of success, not even at par, but well above par, which is why USC MPA online is number one. Um, and uh, you can actually teach other people how to thrive in the same type of environment. So it's a little bit of like an adjustment for people, but um, and that's where actually my new military background came in. It was just kind of leading people into being uncomfortable with being uncomfortable or being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and that's why I was, I'm, I'm used to that. You know, I, I've had years and years of that. So that was no different, but um, that's kind of where we're at right now as a city. We're uh, going into FY21. Obviously all the budget challenges are still pretty prevalent for, I don't know who is doing well, um, especially here in Northern Virginia, where you would think it, it can't actually penetrate and hurt these areas just because there's, you know, these are very, very wealthy municipalities, but everybody is kind of getting the hit. Um, and we're just now getting to the point where our CARES Act funding, which you said there is no direct federal appropriation, it's actually coming through the state. Um, you have to meet certain thresholds in order to get direct funding. So we've got our little, our pool of money, our FEMA reimbursement stuff is coming in. We're actually coming up with a game plan, but uh, it's actually more exciting now than actually when I actually first got to the city because um, everybody wants you to act now. So it's almost like those little bit of constraints, even at the local level, which is pretty minimal or even lessened now too. So people are more excited to get things done. So that's my little spiel. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I've never seen you so animated. I love the the excitement you have with my hands. I'm a hand talker guy. That's the one thing. That's why I usually turn off my camera. People get uh, distracted by it. Um, I think Keith talked about that too. The, the, the fact that everything is so upside down uh, really has a whole set of uh, opportunities. And I think that's what you were talking about. So Keith, I'm going to ask you my question. Anybody else has questions tonight for our guests? I would love to, entertain those if you'll put them in the chat box. Emily or I will feed them, uh, feel them to our, our guests. Um, Keith, when you and I were talking about this, and I've had a number of student projects who've worked on Section 230 regulations at the federal level about liability for social media, which came in the news a couple of weeks ago, um, and we've worked on Airbnb. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is in this collapse of tourism, in Hawaii because it's so far to get there. You have to take a plane or a boat and cruise ships weren't exactly the thing lately. Um, how do you see the opportunity uh, for you and your agency to work work out of this calamity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I think, back up, because that's a, that's a huge um, question for a very short amount of time that I have to, uh, to answer it. So um, l let me just start by saying that um, you know, one of the, you know, the, the primary economic engine for the state of Hawaii is tourism, period. Um, you know, and, you know, having it shut down because of a pandemic um, has created a lot of problems for us. And prior to this pandemic hitting, though, I want to just mention that tourism, you know, was not, there it didn't create a lot of favor with, um, with residents. So there was a, there was this sense that, you know, we were, um, we were not in balance um, that, you know, the, the residents were being um, negatively impacted by the amount of visitors that perhaps were at our, our, if you want to call it carrying capacity, you know, for visitors within, within our communities. And, um, you know, there was a lot of, um, uh, what we were noticing was that, you know, vis uh, residents were just not happy um, with, with, the tour with the visitor industry. And then this, this pandemic hit, and now we have absolutely zero, um, you know, of visitors here. Um, and so the, the conversation is now is more about how do we reset? How do we prepare ourselves for the new normal? What, where do we want to be as a state as it relates to tourism going forward? How can we better um, have a better relationship with our residents about tourism, you know, so that when we bring it back online, it's done in a very thoughtful um, and balanced way, thinking about, 
And how do we have sustainable tourism? How do we, you know, make sure that our natural resources are protect, protected? How do we ensure that the Hawaiian culture is, is you know, properly uh, presented, you know, to our visitors and not some contrived, you know, um, you know, version of what the Hawaiian culture is. We, we want authenticity, right, as it relates to that, you know, and, and how do we, um, how do we truly engage the community and support the community? And, and all of that kind of com culminates, you know, into the strategic plan, which we had amazing, interestingly enough, had rolled out in January, <laughs> um, where we were beginning to, you know, think about, not think about, but actually, you know, go from st strategy to actual tactical, you know, programs to push us in that direction. And then all of a sudden everything collapsed. So, so actually, you know, it, it it's, um, it's given us an opportunity to, again, like I said, push the reset button without really, you know, without, you know, um, it just through, through a disaster, as bad as that sounds, you know, and now, you know, we as a community are going to begin that process of bringing it back online um, in a safe way. And that's the other part of it, too, because we're in a, we're an island state, you know, we have very limited resources, we have very limited um, hospitals, you know, and access to those kinds of emergency medical um, care. And so we have to be very careful in the way that we do that. And we have to have protocols in place, you know, for the different industries, such as, you know, at the hotels, right? You know, really think about this, you know, you have these visitors coming in and they're staying in hotels. How do you keep them safe? And how do you keep the, uh, the support team who's supporting those visitors safe? And, you know, you had mentioned a little bit about um, Airbnb and, you know, one of the challenges, one of the challenges we face here is that, um, and we had faced was that we had these hotels in very specific areas. We have zoned areas for hotels, but the proliferation of Airbnb, and I'm talking about the um, unpermitted Airbnbs, really caused, I think, a lot of that, the, um, the negative uh, feelings towards tourism in the communities, right? Because they, these Airbnbs were proliferating, you know, out into, into residential neighborhoods and taking away, you know, potential homes, you know, from residents that could be renting, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, now I think going going forward, we have to really think about, you know, that conversation and how do we ensure that when our visitors are coming here, they're, again, they're experiencing authentic, you know, um, the authenticity of our culture, but then also, you know, keeping, making sure that they're not um, spilling out into, you know, into our residential communities um, and, and creating a negative impact. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question, Dr. Dora. I know it was kind of long, but, um, you know, we, one of the things we're focusing on is not qu uh, quantity any longer. That's not, in fact, in our strategic plan, we didn't even talk about numbers in terms of, you know, getting, we're at 10.4 million visitors. You know, we were not talking about, oh, let's get to 10.8 or let's get to 11. It was more about, okay, how do we bring the quality visitor back to the state um, who's willing to spend a little bit more for the experience, but then also how do we reinvest? So those are the conversations that are ongoing um, right now. Uh, from a very um, tactical level um, and you know it's it, it's an ongoing conversation um, that's at this that's happening right now at the legislature with our governor with the legislators um, with our county leaders because that's the other part too and I mentioned this the interconnectivity right we cannot forget that we have these four counties if you've ever been to the state of Hawaii we've got four counties um, that we need to make sure they're engaged in that process what do they want from tourism? How do they see tourism moving forward and making sure that their voice is heard so that when we push out our branding efforts, it incorporates that. So, sorry for taking so long to answer the question. I and Hawaii is such a unique and, and yet, you know, not distinct example from among our, you know, American federalism system. And I think one of the beauties of our program is that it works for people across the spectrum, not only in public private uh, nonprofit sectors, but in states that range from the islands to the East Coast. Um, and, and that you all bring your jurisdictional knowledge and the regional differences and bring those together and learn from each other. And I learn from all of you. It's really quite interesting. Um, the next question I'm gonna to shoot to Stacy. Um, Stacy, I know that it, today, yeah, today or yesterday, the Congressional Budget Office released a report that suggested, based on a study that they had conducted, that the economic impact would not last 10 years after this pandemic, but perhaps three, because it was their belief that the jobs are not gone, the 40 million unemployed 
um, that the demand is there for those jobs, that they will come back, that it's, a, it's gonna be a process, which they estimated to be 36 months. Um, the question for you, and, and sort of that fascinated me that um, they did believe that this was not, this wasn't a particularly economic realignment, although listening to all of you talk about the opportunity to do things differently, I think is fascinating. The question here is, how does your organization view job prospects, particularly related to those uh, of us who have an interest in careers in public administration. Um, in a difficult fiscal environment where the assumption might be, oh, well, there's going to be no money, there won't be any jobs. Um, uh, according to the CBO, you know, jobs across the board will still be there. I know that a number of agencies like Los Angeles County have a very senior executive pool and a senior workforce. Um, anyway, I'll stop talking and ask that question. What is it? What is it the NLC uh, is projecting and how do you look at careers and the opportunities to work in this environment? Um, I think it's a great question. And, you know, obviously cities are not immune to the economic downturn. And as I already said, I think NLC really views these cities as essential to, to getting our economies running up and running again. And it's important to remember that um, a lot of workers in cities are essential. Cities themselves are essential. And a lot of the workers in those cities are essential. And so even, um, you know, in the city of Chattanooga, for example, they've already announced a hiring freeze that for non-essential occupations. Um, and so there are a lot of positions that are still going to be being filled in cities like Chattanooga, where I live, but all across the country. Um, and I think, you know, it's a little too, too early probably for NLC to take, an, you know, uh, a hard and fast projection of exactly what we're seeing. But, um, you know, we, we're optimistic that the you know local government careers are still great careers cities are still going to need talented people i also think you know i approach everything from a city's perspective but it's important for the folks on this call to understand that the skills that you get at price will serve you well in agencies in counties in state governments um and you know our county health department is expanding like crazy right now um and so are some of our other first responder type agencies during this pandemic and so while we may see cities that don't have some of those um, health functions or other emergency response functions contract slightly due to their fiscal constraints, there may be other agencies and other opportunities that are expanding because that's the nature of this particular emergency. Um, and I can't stress enough how universal, I mean, I went from working in a local government to working in an association, which is, a, which is outside of the field, but related. And I feel like I use the skills that I learned at Price all the time. So I do think it's a very transferable skill set. Um, but but I wouldn't be too bleak about the about the job opportunities in local government either. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine, we have a question I think that's perfect for you. I know that you know a lot about the distinctions between elected officials leading the charge and um, expert uh, um, administration. So obviously in smaller cities with part-time council, uh, often the administrators and the CEOs and the city leadership have an outsized role that you might not see in some leadership perspectives in larger cities or the kinds of cities and states where their leaders are doing daily press conferences, for instance, in this pandemic. Um, and so you have great familiarity with day-to-day -day operations and decision-making because your elected body are, are volunteer, essentially. And, mm -hmm. and they have their own businesses and their own day jobs. In a time of crisis, um, when the public looks to an elected official or they might seek a leading role, what kind of challenge does that bring to you? And how have you seen it handled? And what kinds of comment, commentary or suggestions can you make? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I think we are in exactly that situation, that we have a part-time council um, who had full-time day jobs that were also imploding <laughs> with the, the whole pandemic. Um, and, and we had an interesting situation where our mayor was trying to not back off, but, but really let the experts speak and be the authority on the topic. And we were getting um, feedback from our residents that, that no, we wanna hear from our mayor. What does our mayor think about this? And we had to rethink a little bit about really um, helping him shine in this situation. 
Um, and I think one of the main ways that you can do that, it's so important to have effective communication with your elected officials. Um, and we are lucky to have good relationships with our electeds and you need to foster those and then they'll pay off in situations like this. Um, and so we were very communicative with our mayor. We gave him um, up to the minute information. It felt like every hour things were changing. Um, heavy communication with him. And then we were able to, because he was informed, we were able to feature him and say our social, our social media uh, on the pandemic. He was able to speak from a place of authority on this whole topic, even though he worked for a major financial institution that was also struggling. Um, and so he was dealing with that while he was also making time for us, which we were very appreciative of. Um, so serious communication, uh, can't stress that enough. And also we really found that um, once, once the immediate crisis is over, it, try to find wins <laughs> where you can that make um, everybody feel good. That sounds too, too simplistic, but, but that bring people together in this situation. We started doing the Great Plates program through FEMA, which feeds homebound seniors through local restaurants. Um, and it was a great moment for our council. They felt like, you know, we really can do something in this situation. It's been great with our community just to bring everybody together. Staff even felt like, hey, we can finally put our efforts into something positive that's really making a difference. Um, and our council has just loved kind of uh, projecting confidence into the community with examples like that. So I would say develop the relationship with your electeds way prior to anything like this <laughs> so that you can uh, cash in on that in situations like this, build that trust, communicate very heavily, create opportunities for um, them to shine in your community and try to find those wins that people can, can feel positive about when they don't feel like there's much to be positive about. That's great advice. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I have a question that uh, from the chat line, and many of you mentioned technology uh, or technology and data or uh, leveraging technology. I think, Stacy, you, you in fact work at the nexus of government and technology. Um, so I'll ask a self-serving question since I'm the one that delivers the first lecture on digital literacy in our uh, opening residency. What at USC set you up for being able to work at the, you know, what I think is state of the art and sort of the coming, the coming art form, particularly in city and county government. That's all throw it open to any of you uh, to talk about, um, you know, was your master's program in an online format useful for that digital knowledge or the technology piece, or did you pick that all up just in your, in your, your professional expertise at work? So anybody? It was so helpful. Oh my goodness. While, while all of my colleagues were struggling to adapt themselves to an online environment, um, I had already done it. I can't, uh, can't express how helpful it was. It was, they were dealing with the crisis and trying to educate themselves digitally and I didn't have to. Um, so I knew how to conduct myself that way. Um, I just, it was priceless. <laughs> the price school education was priceless in that regard. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see how much of it we keep. I hope we keep a lot of it. Um, people that I never thought would be converted to kind of online engagement are on board now. So that's going to be really interesting for me. I don't know what, what you all think. I can go talk to perfectly. Deep. Um, so the one thing that I would kind of advise to anybody who goes to this program, because, you know, you are going to be introduced to just kind of the framework of how to emphasize the importance of technology. But as far as like 
what specific technology platforms that are out there that are leveraged on a day-to-day -day basis by government administrators. That's where you need to kind of immerse yourself in kind of what, what I would kind of liken to say, like the, the professional um, organizations that are associated with local and city county management. So one thing that I can advocate through that if I were a student going through the program today, that I would take advantage of ICMA student rate and go to the International City County Management Association um, they have like a annual uh, conference, you know, every single fall. And it's essentially like a trade show for what local government administrator technology platforms are out there, you know, civic engagement type platforms. You know, if you're a government administrator that is, you know, you, you should be as familiar with ArcGIS and Esri type platform as you are with like Amazon ordering platforms. You know, you should know what Tableau is and how you can use it to manage your kind of financial data. If you are a municipality that is, um, can afford a Tableau type engine, but all the other types of engines that are out there to kind of manage it. So, you know, gone are the days of the, you know, we're all, our accounting team is wearing those like, you know, transparent green visors back there in the back thing and they're just kind of plugging and chugging data you know everybody's using a more uh, dynamic tool to be able to process financial transactions through whatever online payment portal that they might have or is it web um, versus mobile based and you know kind of how that filters through your organization and how you can report on that data what kind of transparency tools do you have that allow you to essentially build um, visual, almost like um, representation of your strategic plan and how you're attaching spending to strategic objectives within the city. Um, there's a lot of different ways. What web platform are you using? There's a bunch of different examples that are out there. And does that platform allow you to not only seamlessly channel people in, because I'm sorry, I'm wearing my JP Morgan marketing hat right now, how to channel people in to kind of engage with government, but also, um, how are you making it easy for them while you're there? What's that user experience like when you get there? And the only way you can really get a, 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 a really good substantive feel for that is, is to go out there and put yourself in that environment. And I would consider ICMA's Gano Conference to be a really great one because it's very specific for local government management. Um, there are a bunch of different tools out there. I'm sure Stacy knows of a bunch of the National League of Cities and her work, but that was an eye opener for me, um, just because I was coming from a background that, you know, I didn't have much experience with that. Yeah, and I can just chime in a little, I think one thing that USC uniquely teaches you to do is how to work in a team remotely and virtually. And that is something that you're not going to get in lots of other places. And it is critical to your success, especially in this environment. So, you know, working remote, I don't even like that term very much, but like, you know, people can, you can get used to it. You can get used to talking on Zoom, but figuring out how you talk about your strengths, how you talk about your challenges, structural, cultural, how you do all those things and get comfortable doing that digitally um, is something that, in, that USC taught me that I use all the time. Um, and, and so I think that's a, that, that gave me a big leg up. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to echo, I'll echo everything my colleagues just stated, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, technology, you know, through USC, it makes it second nature. I mean, it's like, you know, when we decided to telework because we could no longer come into the office, I mean, I, I've, I've been on so many Zoom calls and team meetings and, you know, I mean, you name it, but I, it's been extremely productive because, you know, USC kind of prepped me for, you know, how to work together, you know, using these technologies. Um, so I don't want to repeat everything that my colleagues just said, but it's absolutely true. I mean, I, you know, when we switched to telework, it was like second nature. And, um, you know, I want to thank USC for helping me get there. So, and, you know, I just also want to mention, you know, Arc, you, Chris, you mentioned ArcGIS um, as a platform. And, you know, I'm not a GIS person, but, you know, through my, my work here at um, the Hawaii Tourism Authority, we've leveraged the, the ArcGIS platform for our database for all the incoming passenger data that we're collecting um, as part of our contact tracing efforts related to this whole thing. So, you know, and, uh, you know, again, you have to be comfortable and you have to be willing to explore and utilize these new technologies that you maybe are a little bit un uncomfortable with, but, you know, breaking down that barrier, I think is really important and USC really preps you for that. Thank you, everybody. I, 
I would just want to make a comment. We have a capstone team currently working on surveillance. So um, any of you who are on that team who might be on the call tonight have two new experts to go talk to uh, who could be very useful for you in your capstone outreach. Would the four of you mind taking just a minute before we close and sharing what capstone project um, you worked on uh, and what the topic was? I, Chris, I'm going to start with you because I never could figure out uh, the nature of the capstone project that you you bid on and then were assigned. It, you, you all explained it to me much later, but yeah, uh, we were we, we were team trash, so it was great. Um, essentially, our client was the uh, executive office for the mayor of Los Angeles. So it was Eric Arcetti's staff at the time, and essentially, what they were trying to do was build a performance stat-like initiative around assessing the cleanliness of the city, like how they're combating the public's perception of how dirty Los Angeles. That sounds like a big issue because it's one that obviously comes up. So what do they do? So we went and set um, essentially a, a best practices kind of assessment through other types of cities. So, you know, who else out there has clean stat type initiatives and how are they using that to model a specific performance management initiative for their city so they can better allocate resources and not spend uh, a bunch of time um, just kind of addressing issues as they pop up, Get, go from reactive to strategic. So it was kind of a, uh, a kind of a blend of performance management technology and best practices assessments for it. I remember it well. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about your capstone project that you're- yeah. you Oh gosh, you're, you're bringing me back to uh, 2014, but we, um, we did a project uh, with the, uh, the city of Fresno uh, regarding uh, homelessness. Um, and you know, trying to help them find some innovative solutions to deal with um, the growing issue of um, of homelessness within that community. And um, you know, it was a great project. I think it really opened up our eyes. You know, in terms of the different um, the, the the different uh, programs that were available to try to fight that um, you know unfortunate social issue that we're all dealing with, no matter where you are and where you live. You know, homelessness affects us all affects all communities. Everybody's dealing with it. And, um, you know, so it was a great program and uh, it was an award-winning program, by the way. So, um, award-winning capstone project. <laughs> yes, it was. Congratulations again. Stacy. What, what capstone project were you on? This is so bad. I've just been chatting, Catherine, that I don't really remember. <laughs> I remember that we we worked on it was for an environmental nonprofit and I, it was program development um, and we were industry. Yes, and we were I believe doing some program evaluation work for them. They'd launched a pilot and we were doing program evaluation, helping them plan the evaluation for their pilot um, and try to help give them some advice about whether they should scale up their pilot or not. But I can't remember exactly the details of the pilot. Um, but it was an incredibly fun project to work on and I had a great team and I really enjoyed it. It's just, there's, there's been a lot of projects and pilots since then. <laughs> Northwest Green Chemistry um, funded out of the EPA. It was a very successful project. They have since used that, succeeded and grown, uh, have hired one of our students and are now in the process of hiring a second one since that project. So you that's did awesome. That's great. And Catherine, tell us about your capstone project. Yes, so I and my teammates, we developed a tool for evaluating data privacy, uh, the societal uh, benefits, pro societal pros and cons, and how can officials um, sort of view that in, uh, when they make decisions about how much data privacy does our nation need or want um, and we determined that it would cost about a cheap cup of coffee a day for every um, American and we did it for uh, federal officials associated with the executive branch of the government. I will say it was the most difficult thing I have ever done um, and it was hands down one of the best things I've ever done because it really taught me uh, how far I can push myself, <laughs> which is way, way, way farther than I thought before I enrolled in USC. Um, and so it, it taught me a lot about myself, a lot about my capabilities, um, and was a huge, 
uh, formative experience for me. So if you, if you enroll in USC and you find yourself um, crying during capstone, totally normal and totally good. And it will turn you into the best administrator you can be. Thanks. Keith had a hard stop for a meeting today because it's only the middle of the afternoon for him. Um, so Emily, I'll turn it back to you. We've covered the gamut tonight. I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, questions about our curriculum, the classes we teach, more about Capstone can all be answered by Emily and her colleague, Emily, um, and, and any of us to follow up. Emily knows how to get me and, and can reach out. So Emily, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Dora, and thank you to our alumni who are here this evening. Um, so thrilled to be able to spend this time with you guys, learn a little bit more about your experiences as well. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, if you need anything from the admissions team, feel free to give us a call. We'll all be in the office tomorrow, and we're happy to help. So have a great night, and hope you guys have a great day as well. Fight on, everybody. Thanks. Fight on. Thanks, everybody.